Hi hey everybody, my name is Ryan, and sorry this episode took a little longer than expected to put together. Summer was a little busier than I expected, but I've been working on lots of new projects when I've had the time to do so. I appreciate your patience with this series, and I hope you all like this newest episode. So without further ado, let's get right into it. Deserts on planet Earth are often thought of as cruel, inhospitable places, almost completely devoid of any life. But in actuality, deserts are often brimming with life forms that are specially adapted to their harsh conditions. These plants and animals thrive in some of the most extreme conditions where other life cannot. The same is true, of course, on Mustalon as well. So let's meet some of the many creatures that make the desert their home. The first creature on our tour today is Venusion Nauseator, or the Vesperto. This mid-sized descendant of skunks has found its calling as a desert generalist, eating anything and everything it can get a hold of. While the Vesperto might not appear very intimidating at first glance, it may very well be one of the most feared animals in the desert. It has two main defenses against enemies, the most visible of which are a pair of small tusks normally used to tear into tough plant matter, but can also be used as a deadly weapon against would-be predators. The second defense mechanism is what truly makes the Vesperto stand out. Like its ancestors, it sprays a foul-smelling odor from scent glands near the base of its tail. The spray does more than smell bad, though. Any creature that comes into contact with it becomes violently ill for up to half an hour, giving the Vesperto plenty of time to escape while the predator is heaving its guts out onto the desert sands. As long as the Vesperto is able to turn around in time to spray its enemies, it's basically invincible, especially since most animals already know to give it a wide berth. Another desert animal with a painful defense mechanism is Penacris zericola, the desert quill rat. This mouse descendant has evolved sharp quills like those of a porcupine. Also similar to some porcupine species, it is an excellent digger of burrows, preferring to shelter underground during the heat of the day and only coming out to forage at night. They prefer to live alone, but are perfectly happy to socialize with other quill rats they meet while foraging. To attract a mate, males will sit on top of a rock that they deem suitable and make a series of chirping calls to let any nearby females know that they are healthy and strong. The louder the male, the more attractive he is to females. Not all desert creatures of Mustalon are on the smaller side, though. Diprotoceros aridius, the Dromalox, is a very tall descendant of prairie dogs that use their long legs to traverse the desert in search of food. Dromaloxes travel in small family groups consisting mostly of females and their young, while males tend to be more solitary. Both males and females sport a pair of short horns, but males do tend to be physically a bit larger than females. When fighting for dominance or for mating rights, males will often rear up on their hind legs as a show of intimidation. If neither male backs down, however, a fight will break out in which the opposing males ram their heads into each other's rib cages. These fights can lead to fatal injury and so are typically only used as a last resort. The Dromalox's long legs also serve them well as a means of escape from pursuit predators like Xerotherium drumicus, the Desert Wackle. Like most wackle species, the desert wackle is a social hunter and lives in very tight-knit family groups consisting of up to 10 individuals. Desert wackles are superb long-distance runners and can pursue prey for days at a time, relying on their stamina and endurance to wear down their prey both physically and psychologically. Because of this, the territory of a single family can be upwards of 1,000 square miles or 2,590 square kilometers. Only a select few adults in the group go out on these long hunting trips. At least two or three adults, usually adolescent offspring of the dominant breeding pair, will stay behind to look after their younger siblings and protect them from other desert predators. Another predator that many desert residents are constantly wary of is Cryptomelis venator, the pit badger. These larger descendants of badgers have developed a unique hunting strategy for an animal their size. While they do patrol their large territories to scavenge and occasionally chase down prey, the preferred method of the pit badger is to dig a burrow along an established game trail or near a water source and lie in wait for a large herbivore like the Dromalox to come near enough for the pit badger to lunge out of its hole and take the prey by surprise. Short, powerful jaws mean that once the pit badger has a hold of their victim, they aren't getting away. The pit badger must still be careful, though, and make sure that its prey is unable to kick it and land a potentially fatal blow to their skull or rib cage. If the badger cannot latch onto the throat of its prey, then it must be prepared to dodge powerful kicks, especially from an adult Dromalox. While much of the desert seems to be nothing more than an open expanse, there are places aside from underground where small prey can take shelter. Cactopyla fortis, the colonial cactus, is the first plant entry into Project Mustalon and a true desert survivor. The colonial cactus appears to be many cacti growing near each other, but is in fact one single organism. 
The colonial cactus reproduces asexually, propagating itself by creating offspring genetically identical to a parent plant. Every cactus in one of these clusters shares the exact same root system that distributes resources to every part of the colony. The colonial cactus grows in tight clusters called a cactus cage. Far from being a prison, though, it actually provides shelter for many small creatures of the desert as a source of shade, food, and protection from predators. Among the animals that make their home in these cactus cages is Cautipluma acrobatica, the feather tail. These highly social mice dig burrows in and around colonial cacti clusters and rely on them heavily for protection. Male feather tails sport a feather-like plume of hair at the end of their tails that they use as a mating display. When a male wants to attract a female, he does a handstand with his front paws and raises his plume high into the air. Males that can handstand the longest are able to demonstrate to females their strength and virility, and secure the right to pass their genes on to the next generation. There is one predator, however, that is occasionally able to penetrate the defenses of a cactus cage. Talpersus minor, the mole bear, is a small badger descendant capable of pursuing prey like the feather tail into their burrows. These fierce, tenacious little hunters can not only follow mice into their burrows, but are able to quickly dig to expand the size of a burrow that proves to be too small for them to enter. To combat this, Feathertails dig several false entrances on the outer edges of their colonies. If the badger goes into one of these dead-end tunnels, it gives the mice plenty of time to escape through the back entrances of their elaborate tunnel systems. Another creature that takes advantage of the Feathertail burrows is Fossinolus tenellus, or as I like to call them, the Skedaddler. These short-limbed anole descendants often make their homes in the abandoned burrows of a Feathertail colony. Since they are no threat to their young, preferring to eat insects, the feather tails usually tolerate one or two skedaddlers taking advantage of old, unused burrows. To expand their burrows, skedaddlers have a flattened, shovel-like nose they use to scoop away sand and soil as they dig. This comes in handy when it comes time for a female to lay eggs. She will usually scrape out a shallow pit in her burrow to lay her eggs in, after which she covers the eggs in sand. This protects them from potentially being found and eaten by her feather tail hosts. Another anole descendant also makes itself at home in and around the cactus cage, but has little to fear from predators on the ground. Xeropteryx veluser, the desert kite, uses its membranous wing structures to glide from cactus to cactus. The fan-like structure at the end of their tail allows them to glide further than almost any other gliding reptile on Mustelon, which comes in handy when places of food and shelter are few and far between. The last anole descendant and the last animal on our tour has little to fear from ground predators too, although this reptile has a very different strategy from both their gliding and burrowing cousins. Acutocotus stegoscutus, the stego, has developed a similar defense to the quill rat, with sharp, spiky osteoderms all along its back and tail. The stego is herbivorous, and also likes to dwell near cactus cages for food and shelter. Males sport a bright blue dewlap that they use to attract females and intimidate rival males. They are not exactly social, but they are often found in small groups. While they are not the largest of reptiles by any means, they have managed to grow to a considerable size compared to their tiny ancestors. The reptiles may not be much of a match for the mammals at this point in Mustelon's history, but the universe is unpredictable and reptiles may be able to stake a claim for themselves in the future. Only time will tell, though. That's the end of this entry into Project Mustelon. Sorry I wasn't able to make more over the summer like I was hoping, but I hope you guys enjoyed this one. The fall semester will be starting back up again soon, so I'll have less time than I'd like to work on this series. I feel like I've mentioned way too many times now that I've been working on ideas for other projects in the background, but I have yet to show anything for it. So far the only thing I've done is the Dire Wolf video. But to keep myself from getting too burnt out on Mustelon, I may be taking a bit of a break from it in favor of other projects I've been itching to start. I don't want to stop muscle on altogether, but the episodes I do make may be way shorter than the rest of the series, maybe focusing on one animal or a group of animals. So for those of you only here for muscle on, there's no need to worry about it disappearing. But I do want to devote some time to making other videos on other topics that interest me too. In the meantime, if you want to support Project Muscle on and this channel as a whole, please consider joining my Patreon to get some special rewards and help me dedicate more time to making more videos. Until next time, stay creative and stay curious.